guys, welcome back. Oh, how are you doing? Hope you're having a great day. <laughs> and this one, we're going to be looking at some general assisting tasks. You know, basic stuff that's asked on most every job. I'm not going to go into details of doing soundscapes or uh, applying detailed effects or, you know, green screen work or all kinds of other assisting stuff or assemble editing or anything like that. Um, but this is stuff, you know, like your dailies and... Um, you know, providing technical assistance to the editor. This is just some basically an advice module of, of some general stuff that's good to know uh, and what's expected of you as an assistant on the job. Um, so, hope you find it informative. Should definitely be one of the lighter ones. I'm also going to be using some of my earlier videos and referencing those since I've already covered a lot of this stuff in depth in other videos. Um, so I'll be referencing those a lot. Um, so, yeah, hope you enjoy it and let me know what you think. <clears throat> hey everyone, welcome back. So, continuing on from last time, we have all of our synced subclips for the film here, right? I've gathered them all into one bin. And we've got all of our gathered well tracks here at the bottom. So at the end of the shoot day, I would have gathered these and put them in their own bin. So well tracks and Atmos tracks and stuff. They can go on a bin together. I will still put them in the scene bin because um, a lot of them are specific for a scene. You know, they, they're that one I've got it in the file name, scene three Atmos. Um, you know, scene one exterior house Atmos. Um, and so I like to put the scene name as well as a description of what it is because even if it was recorded for a particular scene, we may be able to use it elsewhere. Um, so as we're prepping scene bins, we'll put them in there. But we'll also have them in the well track so that if people want Atmos for a scene they forgot to record Atmos for, they can just go look in there. Um, so, on the topic of creating scene bins, let's do that. Because um, that would be the first thing that you're doing. Because as I believe I have mentioned in the course before, getting your scene bins together and material ready for the editor is the part you want to be doing, you know, reliably and checked, but the quickest um, to get it ready for them. Uh, so let's sort of pick a scene to demonstrate this. Uh, we'll do scene three. Scene three was that nice day two stuff, very clean. Now, if this was, say, um, a series, you know, I might call it, you know, four underscore scene three, if it was episode four or something like that. You can various ways to call it. And um, editor's preferences will start to come in big time from here. Um, I know some editors that want the scene named, um, the scene number, and then a description of the scene. That's quite common as well, especially if you're on a film or something where you might have a lot of scenes, you know, and you don't necessarily remember them by the number. Um, so it'll be scene three, Jerry at phone box. And then they know as soon as they see that, oh yeah, I know, I know what that scene is, what's going on there. So we'll go. Move this over so I can see. We'll grab our sub clips and we'll alt drag them into there. So we've got our clones. The difference between clones and duplicates was explained in the last module, but I tend to use uh, clones. Um, and I'll grab that Atmos track there as well. Alt drag. Boom. So we've got it in here. Now, uh, prepping a scene bin. It's all about your editor's preferences. It's all about tailored the, the, the way that they can recognize the material that they like the quickest and the easiest and have it laid out for them. Now, I have uh, done a video previously on five different ways you can lay out a scene bin with five suggestions. I'll have that link down below as well as have a card um, up above me just now. But I will make, I will prep this scene bin here uh, as a sort of general, generic, um, common way I've seen a lot of scene bins prepared um, just so that you're equipped with at least that one option and this this would have been the way I've done it for the first you know a couple of years of assisting um, because quite a few editors were happy with it um, so first of all I'll do a, a select the column in the avid bin and do a command E to sort it um, and then I'll jump over to frame view which is this button here Right now, for the purposes of uh, demonstrating prepping this scene bin um, <clears throat> in a way that you can see it, in a way that I can work with it, um, because I'm using my MacBook Pro screen that's quite small, um, and I, I'm away from home, I don't have my extra monitor and screen real estate, I'm going to undock this bin by clicking and dragging from the tab there, 
to bring it out. And I'll just use the bin on its own as a separate window while I do this. Right, so we can see we're in frame view, we've got all of our frames, um, but they're a bit small for, he for me, so I'm going to go Command L and just tap that a few times to make them bigger. There's actually a slider up here now as well that you can use, but I'm using Command L out of habit, that slider wasn't there until the new UI. And, you know, that, that habit's too, too many years ingrained into me to break, so Command L and Command K to bigger and smaller. And once I've got a, a size that I'm happy to work with, you know, you might want it bigger or smaller. I'm going to go into my bin fast menu here and align and fill. And then I'll go fill sorted. And what this is going to do is it's going to just uh, resort these in the bin with the screen real estate you've set of how big the window is in order that they are sorted in text view. So it's not specifically the order of their name or anything like that, it's whatever order you've sorted them in text view. Um, so if you've done it backwards order, time code order, whatever, it'll do it that way. So go fill sorted uh, because I want them in uh, chronological order. And then I'm just going to reorder these so that there's one row per slate. Right, now you can see this looks a bit naff now, it's a bit messy. You know, they're all kind of like just roughly throw it together here. Um, but we can fix that by snapping them to a grid with Command T. Oh, then they all snap to a grid. But you can do this also in the newer version of Avid. There is a feature to um, a called Snap to Grid, which has been added up here in the bin menu. So we can go Snap to Grid, and then we can go Enable. And then we, we can see visually the grid that we're snapping to and just drag it around and it will snap there. Uh, which I tend to wait until this point to use and then anything that didn't snap right I will fix using this method. Or wilds in this case because they're not part of a row, um, part of a slate. So I'll put them off the axis and just out a little bit. I mean it is obvious because the thumbnail is a waveform but still. So that's has got the rough order. But you can see that our frames, they're all mostly taken up by the slate. And in some cases, the slate is taken up a big chunk of the frame. So it's kind of hard to see what's going on in these, negating the whole point of a frame view. So what I do in this case is I open each one of them up one by one and then just kind of click right into the middle of the shot and add an endpoint. So I'm going to go through and do this for them all. Now this endpoint is going to become our frame, so we want to just make sure that whatever one we choose is showing the action, roughly. So generally speaking, just jumping straight to the middle will do it for you, um, but if you jump straight to the middle and they're in the middle of resetting for another take or something, or you can see the boom, then, you know, pick another frame. <laughs> um, but, um, Jumping straight to the middle, and these all seem to be fine. That's done it. And so now all we need to do with all those endpoints placed is just a command A to select them all and hit Q. Boom. There we go. Now that would be a perfectly acceptable prepped scene bin. Um, and I could redock that. I can just hold Option and drag and drop it into there. And we have our bin map here um, that will allow us to navigate the bin visually. And we can make it a bit smaller, so it's up there. And we can actually see our rows, even though the bin is small and up, up here and docked. Uh, and we can navigate straight to the slates that we want. Um, so that would be sort of a generic way of laying out your bin. Um, I would always clear my marks after that I use to make those thumbnails. Um, and I would do that, you know, progressively for every scene as I pass it to my editor and then as we spoke about in our initial project setup I would drag this into scenes to cut and then when your editor's finished cutting that scene he can drag it into scenes cut and he knows that one's been edited um, so that would be one scene been made but as I was saying this is a very um, generic and simple way of prepping a scene but there are lots of ways to do this 
and you know there's other views like script view that try to do the best of both showing a thumbnail and data um, and we can add a comment field just here um, there's multiple different ways to do frame view and lay stuff out um, you know and, and to, then you get into grouping clips uh, I'm not going to show it here because I'm using footage from the treasurer for this and um, the, it was a single camera shoot but um, in my video that I referenced of five ways to prep a scene bin uh, I did demonstrate it there now <clears throat> another assistant task that would be very common um, for you to do for you to be asked to do uh, is dailies now there's different ways to do dailies it depends on uh, what you're uploading to what the service is um, and how they like it done uh, so for example if you're using something like uh, motion spelled with an x or um, dax then you could be right clicking and just selecting all of your clips as they are and just e exporting them your, your synced clips and you don't have to do any burn-ins or, or prep work for that and uh, the the online service will also apply the the burn-ins to whoever's logging in the, the sort of usually the email address of login is applied as an overlay um, and it will be able to read the time code on the clip and so it can make its own display of that there um, so you don't really need to do too much with those I mean some stuff with DAX you know, you export ALEs and stuff like that as well with it but we won't get into that another way you can do your dailies is uh, with reels um, and you'll be doing these per shoot day um, but I'll demonstrate a couple of different reels that you could do for your dailies as a suggestion um, so if we go We'll create a bin under to dailies for day one. Why not? We'll start at the start. And then I'll go to my subs. Order these by shoot day. There's all my day one stuff. Now you could make a reel for the entire shoot day. You go say day one dailies. and drag and drop everything onto there and then you just need to make your burn-ins um, for your reader um, now this could be a nice way to do it and then it's very tidy um, and you've got all your burn-ins um, but it does sort of result in one long reel that they need to scrub through because um, they're not necessarily going to watch everything um, <clears throat> now I think if if I, if that was me I think I would rather do it per scene um, if I was going to do reels um, so you could do uh, what scenes do we have Sean day one we've got scene four scene five and 16 so I'd go day one scene four dailies grab my scene four stuff and drop it on uh, but however you you know, structure your reels, um, you're going to have to do burn-ins. Um, and we're going to do those using the time code generator. So under your effect palette, under generator, time code burn-in. This is a brilliant tool. It was quite ahead of its time, I think, because the amount of burn-ins and custom stuff that it offers, you know, other NLE still don't offer that level of, you know, uh, overlays. Come at me, Premiere. So up here in the effect editor, um, of opening up the time code effect uh, we can see we've got displays 1 to 4 and text so displays 1 to 4 are custom generators that could be reading just about anything including custom metadata that we've added with our own bin columns it can read those as well and display what it is for any given clip on the timeline and text will be showing text um, anything you type in there you can have it show up um, so quite often this is used to sort of make a watermark um, so for this one I'll, I'll make a watermark I'm going to change the opacity of that background to 0.1 and then I'm going to move this down these little purple anchor points are how you'll move them around and the anchor points are always in the top left of the text box I'm afraid can't really change that and I'll make it a bit bigger again so say 80 and once you build this dailies burn-in template by the way you can save this to your filters bin 
and then just drag and drop it onto your dailies each day. Or, or leave it in your dailies bin as well. And just drag onto the sequences as you make them. Um, but we've got a watermark. Let's get some source clip name information in there. So I'll start at display one. And I haven't went through all of the controls here, but um, you know, I could waste a lot of time going into detail of this effect. I encourage you to go and explore it, uh, but I will highlight some specific stuff. So um, up here, we're choosing what it is that we're showing. And so we can show everything here from time code to source time code of a clip, edge code uh, to do with film, you know, frame counters, VFX counters, that will come into others. Timeline clip text, so if you're adding uh, clip timeline clip notes um, to clips, it can read those. And then source bin columns, this will be any custom that you've added to a specific column or any other column that's in the bin, it can read that. It can even read uh, sequence bin columns. So if you've added any data to the sequence, it can read it there. Um, so basically this is what the reader is reading. So if you look at this generator as a, as a reader, and then where is it getting its information from? So we're setting that here. Um, so I'm going to set this to source clip name. Um, and I'll make this a bit bigger so you can see it. So, we'll go. Meeting. so you can see it there. It's seen it as 4-1. Actually, I'm going to move that watermark. Right, swap those around. That's better. So I'll do the same with my uh, clip reader here. Um, point 0.1 background opacity. Leave the text as it is um, at full opacity. And I don't mind the font that it has. Toughy, that's fine. Yeah, then we have our clip reader. So we can skim along here. And you see that will change depending on what clip that you're hovering over. And, and by default, this is, uh, I think it's set to current. Yeah, current track. And that just means that it's going to look downward on the timeline of where you put the time code generator. And the first track that it hits that's got media on it, it's going to read from that. Uh, which for the purposes of this is perfectly fine because we've only got two tracks and the reader's on V2. Um, but if, if you were doing an end sequence or something, which we'll get to in the last module, um, then you could set a specific track to read from, like V1, V2 or something. So I'm going to leave that current track. And then we're going to go to V2 and we're going to add source time code of these clips. So I'll go source time code. Make this the same size. Um, this is this is a scroll bar here to adjust the size, but you can just click it and type a value. I'm doing all of these at 80. And then the background opacity at 0.1. And then I'll just drag and drop that over there. So that would sort of cover most of your bases for dailies. Uh, you've got your source clip name, you've got your source time code, um, and you've got a burn in here. And then your burn in could also be a graphic um, where you could import um, a graphic and use Avid Pan and Scan uh, and put it up there and lower the opacity as I showed an ingesting media module. Yeah, so if you wanted to use the logo of the company, you could do that um, and it worked just as well. Uh, but quite often you end up just using the text and the time code generator works fine for a watermark. Now again, this might come down to the production. They might tell you specifically what kind of burn-ins they want on their dailies, um, how they want it formatted. Uh, this is just to give you an idea of the type of stuff that you'll be doing. Um, so uh, you, you could also be asked to show stuff like um, the source um, camera file name, potentially. Um, so if, if you did... Um, you could have that. I'm just going to change this uh, source clip name reader here rather than build another one and give it the same properties. So for that, we would go source bin column. Um, so it's going to read one of the metadata columns from the source um, uh, clip that it's reading. So we go source clip bin column on current track. And then down here where it says name, because name is a default bin column, you would just select um, tape, which is how I've done my transcodes, the source clip name of the um, original camera file gets chipped into the tape column, or wherever you've put your commonality for your relinking, just select that, and there it's there. 715 0017. But yeah, that gives you sort of an idea of how you would prepare your dailies. Um, so you might go about and make um, 
several of these reels, like one for each scene, um, or maybe one per camera reel for that shoot day. It's really however, you know, it works for your production. So if I was given the choice, that would be how I'd do it. I'd do it per scene. Um, but uh, if, if they wanted it done any particular way, like per camera reel, or for the whole shoot day, or just exporting the clips on their own and uploading them, you know, you can accommodate that as well. So you just export these as a very simple codec, like an H.264 that's not going to be too big a file size. I'll change that data rate down to about, say, 8 megabits. That's probably still overkill. And AC audio. And that'll work quite well for uploading. I'll just save that as, you know, dailies. And then you can export that each each day and upload to your service, whether it's Frame.io or DAX or Pix or Motion or whatever it is that you're using. It could be all kinds of um, services these days. And generally, this is a task that you would do following giving your scene bin to the editor um, because people might be waiting to see the dailies, but they're not waiting quite as urgently as the editor is to start working on them. So you make sure the editor's got everything they need and all their stuff, then you get your dailies exported and uploaded um, for the producers and network execs and everyone to see. Um, and if you have a particularly slow machine, you've only got access to one machine, then you might do this overnight so that you can do the rest of your work and keep yourself available to your editor um, and then set these off at the end of the night, come in the following morning and upload them and send them off. Um, another thing I would also always do is I back up the project every day. Um, at the end of the day, you know, back up somewhere that's not on the Nexus. Um, now, different post facilities will have different opinions about this. You know, they'll have their own backup methods for sure. Um, but nothing's infallible. I've seen a Nexus completely fail and die once, um, which just, it was a very old one. Um, there had been a whole, a whole bunch of power surges, um, a UPS blew, and then the power went blew through that. It was just like a series of unfortunate events and bad things happened. Um, but both me and the editor had been doing a zip copy of the Avid project and putting it on a USB flash drive and taking it home each day. Now, I'm not saying that you put on a flash drive and take it home, but even on the desktop of the computer or something. So I would have just been going to your Avid project, where it is. So I've got our assist one here. And just right click, uh, compress it. Or if you're on Windows, it'll be 7-zip or something like that. So just create a zip file. And then you would just copy this anywhere, even on the desktop of the Avid. So I'm just jumped to my desktop here and just have, like, say, a 100 backups. Um, you'd put the name of whatever your Avid project is and then just name these as per the date. You know, that lovely, 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 lovely naming convention. Um, and just move that in there. And then just have one for each day. Um, it never hurts just to back up the project at the end of each day. And then so you know, at minimum, that's there as your last resort backup. Now, as the assistant, um, the, the job description is in the title. You're the assistant editor. You're there to assist the editors. And one of the main things you're also doing that with can be a bit of technical support. Um, and this one vary editor to editor. You know, some editors might be incredibly technically savvy and other editors might not be technically savvy at all. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, some editors started cutting on the film days and, you know, made the leap to digital because they had to. That's the way the industry was going. But they're not necessarily a fan of technology. Um, and they don't have to be as long as they can run the avenue, as long as they can cut. You know, it's, it's not a technological endeavor, filmmaking. It's a creative one. So as long as they can do the creative part, you can help them with the technical part. But primarily when I'm talking about technical support here, I'm mostly talking about Avid. Um, now, th there will be people in the post facility that will help, um, for sure. Um, and yeah, they could call them, but you have a relationship with the editor and quite often they would rather just ask you and hope that you'll know the answer. Now, I do also have a video on that. It's called uh, 10 Fixes for When Avid Isn't Working. It is one of my longer videos, but there are chapter markers that are named for what each of the fixes are. So you can go through that and have a look. 
Um, and there's all kinds of other stuff. You know, you'll accumulate knowledge of Avid and the software and tech and other things and media formats and compatibilities and all kinds of other stuff as you go. Um, you'll accumulate that and you'll be more helpful to your editor that way. Right, now, another thing that you can quite often be asked to do by your editor on all projects um, is to source media for them. When I say media, I mean sound effects and music. So you'll go and source it, download it from wherever, and ingest it neatly into the project here. Uh, now, when I say source it, I, I do mean it's sort of up to you to source it. It could be from anywhere. So starting with music. So quite often, see if it's just a small thing that they need. Um, I'll do a little search for it, um, if it's just one track, um, and I'll just buy it off of the iTunes store. Uh, and then that kind of works for me, you know, it'll cost me a couple of bucks. But uh, if they're looking for a whole bunch of tracks and they give you a list, or as more quite often, you know, we want a song to evoke a feeling, or, or we want something for the end credits that will, you know, work like this. For music, kind of the big one for me is YouTube. Um, so I have an app called 4K Video Downloader, but that is just one of many. Uh, there are a many YouTube video downloaders um, on the net, um, and uh, most of them will allow you to convert it to an audio file format during the download. Um, so it'll download and then convert it, and you can bring it into Avid. And I can hear what some of you are already thinking, you know, this is copyright, you, know, you can't be ripping stuff off YouTube to use in your projects. Now, I'm talking about, you know, in a professional offline environment, you know, where it's perfectly acceptable because it's never going to be shown like this outside of the small group of people working on it. So your director, the editorial team, um, the primary reason you're doing it is to test out, you know, what tracks might work. Um, it's to test out the feeling of a certain music or will, will that work with this scene or, or just to give you something during your assembly you know, to, to fill out the soundscape. But by the time the film's getting into online and it gets to post sound, there'll be original music compositions added or tracks will be licensed or, you know, that'll all get sorted out down the road. But during offline, it's really common to use all kinds of music, source from wherever, um, just for the purposes of testing stuff out. Um, it's both one of the best and the worst parts of non-linear editing. Um, and if you want to know what I mean by one of the worst, um, check out the, the video that Every Frame of Painting did on, you know, music composition. Now, in terms of sound effects, that's a slightly different story. So there are a number of websites online for downloading sound effects, um, free ones and paid ones and all kinds of stuff. And I will go to them and I have sort of a hierarchy um, of, of places that I'll go to. Uh, like free sound effects uh, isn't too bad. Um, uh, freesound.org is kind of a, a last ditch effort, that's a last resort, uh, but it could be quite good for finding abstract sounds if, if they've asked for something specific and you can't find it anywhere else, because people up record their own sound effects here, all kinds of different stuff, and upload it for users to download. And, and YouTube is course as well, that works uh, for sound effects as well as music. Uh, but for, for me, uh, my big one is uh, pro sound effects. Um, now, this is a professional sound effects website, uh, prosoundeffects.com. Um, you know, the very, very good sound effects. I actually discovered them because Avid did a, a promo, um, you know, with your Avid subscription every now and again, Avid um, very kindly will re um, release uh, gifts like downloadable assets and stuff you get with your subscription. And these can be all kinds of things from, you know, licenses to, to like New Blue, uh, chroma key uh, through to they did a, a small sound effects library with uh, these guys um, and the, the sound effects were just really really good it was a small library but it gave you a taste of sort of the quality of their sound effects and then eventually I I bought one of their sound effects libraries um, and since then I haven't really needed to uh, scour the internet again you know it's a very very good encompassing sound effects library and so I keep this on my drive that I bring into all my jobs in my sound effects folder and there it is and you can tell all these other folders where I've accumulated sound effects you know they do range from about you know a few megabytes through to about three gig or so um, but this one here is 62 gigs so it's it's got a lot of sound effects in there um, of all kinds of stuff and all kinds of categories of, of just anything you can think of um, 
So whenever I need to find any kind of sound effects, I'll generally just come into this top layered sound effects folder and then just do a spotlight search to look see what I'm looking for. So say we're looking for um, um, uh, you know, a cappuccino machine. And then there's one there. Oh, there's a couple. And they look different. So this is clearly something I've searched for on a job and found a few options. Um, uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll search for it. And then when the results come in, I'll just import it straight from there or drag that into the bin. And you can see I've got a few different options of sound effects here. So um, that that is my main sound effects library that I'll use. This Pro Sound Effects First is the one that we got from Avid. Um, uh, Pro Sound Effects Single, so this is if I need to download a single sound effect uh, from their website, which you can do for like, like a couple of bucks. Um, uh, if, I, if I'm really looking for something specific, that's how I'll find it. I'll just go in there and they will have something um, that will work. They just always do. Um, and if I can't find it online, just grab it from them. Um, and then I've got you know a couple of different uh, libraries that I found online. Um, the BBC, this is any ones I've downloaded from them. They've got like 16,000 sound effects or so that you can use for free as long as it's not commercial use. Um, so that one's quite good. Even got a folder of homemade, so if I need to record any folio of my own or something like that. So sometimes if I really can't find something, I'll just make it myself. And the keen-eyed among you there may have noticed as I was coming into this um, that on, on my portable drive that I bring on every job, I have this folder called resources. Um, and this is just resources of all kinds of things that might help me in work. For, for example, I've got Avid stuff. So this will, this will be user settings, um, my default project setup that I can just copy over when I need to set up the project. Got some installers here, um, you know, so that'll be like recent versions of Avid and uh, useful software that I'll take with me on jobs, um, like, you know, my Stream Deck software and various other things. Uh, Royalty free music, um, got, got some of that in there. Uh, that's the, the one we got from Avid, the royalty free music stuff. Uh, and I've got a big folder for temp music as well, which is just sort of soundtracks to movies mostly. Um, as as well as all kinds of different, um, you know, stuff. Some tutorials, like I've got, I just batch download tutorials for like Mocha Pro and, um, you know, advanced plugins and effects and all kinds of stuff. And then I can call upon them if I need to check something. I'll check there first before I'll go on YouTube to see how to do something because I might already have a decent tutorial on it. <clears throat> I think that more or less covers us in terms of, you know, acquiring resources for your project. Uh, I think just the overall note is keep um, stuff that you've downloaded for projects. You know, download it somewhere and then just build upon it. Um, and then you can have a drive, you know, small, uh, high capacity drives are quite cheap now that you can bring them into jobs um, with all of this different stuff. Right now, I could be here all day long talking about assisting tasks and how to do them. Um, but at the end of the day, you're there to assist the editor and it's sort of whatever they need. Um, and if your editor asks you to do something and you're new to assisting um, and you don't know how to do it, I think it's fair to say, I mean, they should know your level of capability um, at the start. But if they ask you to do something and they know you're new and you don't know, there's nothing wrong with saying um, that you, you don't know um, or going and just and saying, hey, yep, I'll, I'll, I'll take a look at that now and then go and Googling it. You know, everybody Google stuff and it's fine and you, and you can figure it out. And then self-teaching will help you learn it and remember it as well. So you're there to assist and help in any way that you can. Um, and if you are an assistant out there and you're on a job and um, there is uh, some task that you've been asked to do and you don't know how to do it, Drop me a comment, let me know, and I'll do a video and I'll cover it for you. Thank you very much for watching, everybody. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, special shout out to Patreon followers who will have watched this early over on Patreon. And you can too. Links down below. You go check it out. Let me know what you think. Um, and I will be back next week at 4 p.m. for the, the finale, the, the final episode in this A100 series. Um, so we've got that to look forward to. Um, and then I actually need to start thinking up of original ideas once again for a unique video every week. 
Yeah, okay. I'll let you know how that goes.